On this week's 51%, we speak with Amy Britton of the Washington Post about the paper's recent analysis of infant mortality and home births across the U.S. and how the country's varying regulations for midwives can make it difficult for expectant mothers to know what they're getting. This is a story about what happens whenever you have a system that is not well regulated. You know, these stories exist because midwives are not truly accepted within healthcare systems in the United States. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on. I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita. I wasn't really in it. I didn't really get it. You are listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jesse King. The number of home births in the U.S. has spiked since the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the CDC, the number of women choosing to give birth at home with a midwife reached a 30-year high in 2021. We've spoken about the benefits of having a midwife multiple times on this show. They can provide more extensive personal care for moms and babies before, during, and after labor. They're more frequently used in Europe, where midwife organizations often tout their benefits. But our main guest today contends giving birth at home in the U.S. is not an inherently safe option, and there are things families should keep in mind before trying it. Amy Britton is an investigative reporter with the Washington Post, and according to a recent analysis by the paper, full-term infants born at home in the U.S. are twice as likely to die as babies born in hospitals. Britton's report specifically follows the story of a Maryland mother who lost her baby while giving birth at home, and the history of the midwife she hired to assist her delivery that day. That midwife, Karen Carr, has faced investigations in multiple states for home births that went wrong. Some of those resulted in felony charges and disciplinary action, while others found no wrongdoing and were decided in her favor. Currently, Britain says Carr is licensed to practice in Maryland and Delaware, but she has been banned from practicing in Virginia. Britain says Carr declined multiple requests to interview for the Post story. Similarly, she did not return a request for comment for WAMC in time for broadcast. Carr's former attorney, who represented her during one of those past investigations, has described the Post story as, quote, unethical. We will hear more from him later on in the show. But Britain says her story is not so much about car as it is about home births and the midwifery system in the U.S. Because if that Maryland mother had known about the prior investigations in the car, then she might not have hired her in the first place. But Britain says finding that information can be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for the average person. The fact that there's different categories of midwives with varying degrees of experience doesn't help in the selection process. And finally, each state has its own standards for licensure. As a result, Britain says it can be hard for expectant mothers to know what they're getting. This American system is is very different from other countries. Um, You know, they don't do things this way in Canada. They don't do things this way in the UK. Um, This American system of essentially having three different classes of midwives is is very different. So there are midwives that you've probably heard of called certified nurse midwives. They are uh, trained as nurses. They have nursing licenses. They also have graduate degrees. Many of them are fully integrated into hospital systems. So um, some of them have uh, practices kind of set up within uh, labor and delivery wards within hospitals, and they work in conjunction with, uh, with obstetricians. So you probably have heard of certified nurse midwives. Um, there's also a class of midwives that's, uh, that's kind of growing in popularity right now called certified midwives. And those are midwives who, while they do not have nursing uh, licenses, they do have graduate degrees. So they've gone through a graduate educational program, and some states are starting to license certified midwives. And they may also work in conjunction uh, with hospitals or with medical providers. And then you have this class of midwives, which our story primarily focuses on, and they're known as certified professional midwives. Uh, Previously, you may have heard them referred to as lay midwives. So these are midwives that do not have nursing licenses. They do not have graduate degrees. They are trained through primarily through apprenticeships. And they account for the majority of home births in America. And this class of midwives, uh, they they were essentially uh, created, their, their, their certification, their initials, the CPM initial, they were created in the mid-1990s. And at the time, you know, very few states 
license them or recognize them as providers. But now that number has grown to the majority of states. So right now, 36 states and the District of Columbia do license or plan to license or pass you know, laws to, to set up licensure for certified professional midwives. So you've really seen that grow in popularity um, over the past couple of decades, and you've seen them kind of get the credibility, um, have the initials, you know, be able to say that they are state licensed providers. Uh, but as you as you can imagine, as, as I've gone through all those different titles, right, certified nurse midwife, certified midwife, certified professional midwife, they all have certified in the name. So you could imagine how that system would be a little bit confusing for consumers. You mentioned in the story that researching a specific midwife can be really difficult, too. Well, I would say, once again, the system really varies from from state to state. You know, even in looking for complaints, uh, the really stunning thing to me is that this midwife who the story primarily focuses on, Karen Carr, if you were to go right now to a the website run by the Maryland State Board of Nursing that exists for the public to look up a licensed provider to see that provider's history, to see if there are any red flags, any disciplinary actions, you would find absolutely nothing of concern. You would not find any of this. You would not find the criminal record. You would not find the fact that she had been disciplined um, in Maryland previously. Um, You would not find the fact that she had been banned in Virginia. So when you look at that, you think, Gosh, what can you know, and 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 how can you know it? And I will say, out of fairness, you know, there are there are midwives who I've spoken to who've said, you know, same problem exists within checking medical licenses because of the way that the United States has done things, which is a very uh, individualized, state-focused approach to let every state decide how they're going to license providers, what rules they're going to have, what information they're going to share with the public, what information they're not, what information they're gonna require public records requests for. Um, So in order to even get this information for the story, you know, we had to file a lawsuit. We had to file extensive public records requests. We had to pay thousands of dollars to get some of these transcripts to really piece together this midwife's uh, history. So I think it does raise raise the question of what a mother can know, um, how can she know it, and how how also can she know what the rules are state to state and, and what the differences are in the level of care that you can expect. Well, the CDC says home births are actually becoming increasingly popular in the U.S. I'd like to talk a little bit about why. You know, the pandemic is top of mind. And, you know, the U.S. at the same time is seeing a rise in maternal mortality. In your reporting, what were some of the reasons you heard from women wanting to give birth at home as opposed to in a hospital? Yeah, it's a really fascinating uh, rise that we see in the data. So home births have risen uh, about 35% uh, over the past five years. You know, and we're talking about planned home births. We're not talking about people who go into labor and accidentally have the baby in their bathroom before they can get to the hospital. These are births that are planned, um, attended by midwives. Uh, so, So when you see that rise, and you also see at the same time a slight drop in hospital births, um, it makes you wonder what's going on here. And I don't wanna assign beliefs to an entire group of people. Obviously there's uh, diversity among the reasons for, for choosing a home birth, but I will tell you a couple of reoccurring themes that I've heard as I've spoken to mothers, as I've spoken to midwives who are kind of a part of this community. One reoccurring theme is that they want to kind of reclaim the birth experience, that there is this idea that the, the idea that, you know, having a baby laboring has kind of been taken over by the medical system in the United States, that it's become a medicalized event, and that birth is, at its core, a natural human process that has nothing to do with medicine. That is one core belief. And the idea is that if you go into a hospital, maybe a doctor would force you to have a C-section, or maybe someone would push you toward an induction, and, and, and that would take away your right to make decisions about your own body. So that is a really core uh, belief, is that it's about taking back your body, taking back your rights, doing what women have done. That, that is one theme that I've heard. Another kind of group, um, I would say, that, that has a strong belief in home births are religious groups and, and certain communities within the United States. 
So if you look at states that have really high home birth rates, one of them would be Pennsylvania. And the reason for that would be that Pennsylvania has, you know, the highest level of, of Amish populations within the United States. That is one aspect of the of the story. And that is actually a community that Karen, uh, the midwife that we reported on, has catered to. They are her most loyal supporters, especially as she's continued to face disciplinary actions, um, criminal proceedings. Uh, you know, even when she had her license suspended, they have consistently supported her. Um, and I went into that community to to try to talk to some um, some people there, and and some of the men did speak to me. Unfortunately, uh, my attempts to speak to women uh, were not successful. But some of the men did speak to me, and and one man told me, very matter of factly, he said, you know, babies die; it's a part of life. Um, so the religious community and the Amish community, you also see pockets of of Christian communities who are who are staunch believers in home births. And then I will say also there is a growing population of of women of color, particularly Hispanic women and Black women, who are increasingly choosing home births over the past five years. And that data comes from the CDC. And I don't want to necessarily ascribe a reason to that, but if you do... Um, read a lot about maternal issues, which it sounds as if you do, you know, you know that there is a maternal mortality crisis in the United States that disproportionately affects women of color. So if the fear is that something bad is going to happen to you or, or that your life is going to be threatened in a hospital, perhaps a home environment would look appealing to you. But as we know in the data right now, um, giving birth at home is not a safer choice for your infant compared to giving birth in a hospital. And I can talk a little bit about those numbers if you want me to. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about that next, because your analysis found some pretty striking numbers. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you went about that research and got that and got to that conclusion. Yeah. So whenever we were reporting the story, what we really wanted to do is take a look at the safety data around home births in the United States. You know, if a parent is making a decision today, what is the safest place to deliver a, a baby in the United States? Because one of the things that struck me whenever I was looking at various uh, certified professional midwives websites is oftentimes they will say repeatedly on these websites, this is a safe choice for low risk mothers. And they will say, you know, it's a safe choice for your baby. But often then when you read the footnotes, they're citing European data. And European data, which is collected in a very different system, you know, a system in which uh, the UK has federal regulation over, over midwives. So I, we wanted to take a look at the US data and what it shows. And it was pretty shocking for, for me to see the finding from the CDC data. So let me just say it very clearly that infants, full-term infants who are born in planned home births are more than twice as likely to die than infants born in hospitals. Wow. I guess, what is it about the European system that's so different from what we have in the U.S.? Is it just the fact that there's those federal regulations in place? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And, you know, to be fair, I didn't go to the U.K. I didn't yeah. extensively <laughs> re report, report on their system. I mean, that would be a really fascinating follow-up story. But my general understanding and looking at how they regulate midwives is that it's it's, it's federally regulated, and their midwives have higher education and training requirements um, that, that meet more of the international standards for midwifery. So the, their class of midwives they're regulating is not equivalent to the certified professional midwives uh, that, that I've spoken about that have the apprenticeship training in the United States, right? So it's kind of apples to oranges. And that's what was a little bit concerning to me when I was repeatedly kind of reading these claims on various websites, citing European data is that I think if you're going to cite European data, there needs to be a disclosure of, hey, this is a very different system with very different safety and federal regulations um, it kind of governing the system than, than what exists right now. Uh, in the United States, um, because when you start doing apples to oranges, that's when it gets that's when it gets really confusing and potentially misleading for the consumers. And one of the things that we really try to control for in our data is uh, we, for instance, took out when we were looking at the the home birth deaths versus the hospital deaths of infants. 
We took out um, infants that were born before 37 weeks. We took out infants that were born at a low birth rate. We took out any reported maternal risk factor. Uh, we took out, um, you know, risk factors for infants, some that may have had, you know, pre-existing uh, conditions in utero, for instance. We took out those cases. We took out cases in which women were birthing at home unattended. It's known as free birthing of, of you know, having a birth without a midwife present. We took out unplanned uh, home births. And we, we even took out the entire state of California because up until 2021, California did not distinguish between planned and unplanned home births in its data. So we didn't want it to be skewed if, if there were unplanned home births that maybe had more uh, negative outcomes. So we were really controlling for every possible factor that we could, and we still see uh, this really stark finding uh, of a death rate that's um, over two times. Well, currently, not all states license certified professional midwives. Have you seen more of a push for licensure in that part of the midwife community or more support for broader federal regulation? So I think that you you really see a divide in the uh, midwifery community about how they approach licensure. And I was talking to, and this actually didn't make it into the print story, but I was talking to one of the leaders of NARM, which is the North American Registry of Midwives, and they're the certification group for midwives such as Karen. And she was telling me that there's this kind of growing sentiment, especially among, you know, younger midwives who are coming up that, Licensure is controversial because this should be a relationship between the mother and the midwife. And do you really want the state, you know, in the middle of, of your relationship with your midwife whenever you're going through labor and going through birth? So there is this kind of backlash, but she described that as, as kind of a minority within the overall midwifery group movement. So I don't want to make it seem like that is a popular viewpoint, but she did acknowledge it, that it does exist. And overall, I would say that, you know, there definitely has been a pro-licensure movement that's that's unfolded within the past decade or two in the United States. And, it, and it's definitely continuing to go in that direction. You know, you just saw, I believe, Iowa was the most recent state to license CPMs this summer. So you still see various states kind of joining this, this uh, growing movement to license them. But um, as a reporter, I will say, I think whenever a state starts to license certified professional midwives, it creates an expectation from the public, rightfully so, that if, if someone is state licensed, that the state has kind of put their stamp of approval on this person. So that was what gave uh, the mother that reached out to me in Maryland kind of reassurance about Karen whenever she was hiring her is, oh, this is a state licensed person. This is legitimate. You know, and and then when you we, when we started to unpack what the licensure process was like, the fact that another state, Wisconsin, de- declined to license her, saying that she posed a threat to public safety, it just raises a lot more questions about okay, what are the rules? What type of decision making is going into this process? And um, you know, is the consumer uh, actually being protected here? Well, Amy, thanks so much for coming on today's show. I guess, what do you hope readers most take away from this story? I just want to make sure that readers of the story know that this is not in any way a story that is anti-midwifery or anti-midwife. It it was important for me to have the story be fair and to talk to as many midwives as possible and to try to understand the reasons that, that people make a choice such as having a home birth or, or hiring a midwife. And this was not intended to kind of, you know, set up a debate of, of home birth versus hospital. But what I do think, and, and I hope that the, that the takeaway will be here is that this system as it exists right now, um, it certainly raises a lot of questions for the public about what they can know, how they can know it, and how they can make the safest choice for themselves and for their child. And I I do think what it has done, it has sparked a kind of a larger conversation about midwifery and about the U.S. system and how it came to be this way in such a fractured regulatory landscape that is in many ways a 
many ways a classic U.S. story, right, of various states deciding to do whatever the heck they're going to do <laughs> and making up their own rules and governing it as, as they choose. There is also a push from a group of midwives. I've heard from one of them, and, you know, she's in the story, Erin uh, Ryan. She's a certified professional midwife in Vermont who works as a consultant. You know, she actually told me that this is a story about what happens whenever you have a system that is not well regulated. You know, these stories exist because midwives are not truly accepted within healthcare systems in the United States. You know, they, they are not truly viewed as equals. And if you continue to have this type of fractured system where they feel as if they're not empowered to speak to doctors directly or they feel as if they're worried about calling 911 if something goes wrong because they're going to be judged, that that actually is going to lead to more dangerous outcomes. So it was really useful for me to talk to her to to hear that perspective. Um, and, and that's what I, I hope that people will take away from it, or at least it will open up kind of a larger conversation. Because sometimes I think whenever, as a reporter, whenever you're trying to unpack what we call a system story, people's eyes kind of glaze over and, you know, they don't want to read about regulations. They don't want to read about systems because that all sounds really boring. But if you tell a story through a mother who has experienced a loss as catastrophic as this one was for, for her, her life, her family's life, if you tell that story and if you really unpack how it unfolded, how it happened, um, I, I think that people kind of come away with a takeaway that can be beyond an individual story. Amy Britton is an investigative reporter with The Washington Post, where much of her coverage has focused on sexual harassment and criminal justice issues. You can find her recent story on home births and certified professional midwives on the paper's website, WashingtonPost.com. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Carr declined an interview with The Post and did not return a request for comment from WAMC in time for broadcast. Her former attorney, Micah Salb of Lippman, Semsker, and Salb, has accused The Post's story of being unfair. Salb represented Carr in 2011 when the Maryland Board of Physicians questioned whether Carr was practicing medicine without a license. This was after Carr pleaded guilty to felony charges and agreed to stop working in Virginia and before Maryland began licensing certified professional midwives in 2015. A Maryland judge ultimately fined Carr $30,000. The Post says Carr eventually got her Maryland license in 2020. Speaking with WAMC, Salve says he feels the Post mischaracterized some of the fatal home births that Carr oversaw, as well as the resulting investigations. In his case, he says the quality of Carr's care was not in question. I think that the Post got a lot wrong, but what I think was most offensive about the Post reporting was that they relayed facts and information in a way that conveyed a negative implication for midwifery. The Post talks about the number of investigations into Karen Carr and says four other investigations were resolved in her favor. Through it all, the Washington Post found Carr continued to deliver babies. Putting those sentences together, they make it sound like Karen was doing something wrong by continuing to practice midwifery when four other investigations found that she didn't do anything wrong. If you could just tell me a little bit more about the case that you represented Carr in, you know, what was sort of the, the question at hand there and what were the facts of that case? In that case, the question, did she practice medicine without a license? doesn't really have a particularly easy answer. The hearing examiner obviously decided that Karen did practice medicine without a license and largely ignored the, this big question that we asked. What does it mean to practice medicine? We asked this question of Dr. Block, Maryland's um, expert witness, and he wasn't able to provide a cogent answer. In uh, an appeal, we raised that point and we pointed out that when a babysitter puts a Band-Aid on a kid's knee, that babysitter is doing precisely the things 
that the state contends constitutes the practice of medicine. The judge's response to that was, we're going to ignore this problem because it is a hypothetical and we do not uh, make law based on hypotheticals. Well, that's just BS. I mean, we make laws based on common sense. And when there's a definition which is not susceptible of clear application, as we proved with that hypothetical, then there's a problem with the definition. The District of Columbia subsequently held a hearing on the same question. By practicing midwifery, did Karen Carr practice medicine without a license? And in a really expansive decision that clearly reflected a great deal of thought and research uh, and inquiry by the hearing examiner, the conclusion was no. Practicing midwifery is not the practice of medicine. To the extent that the Post says that inconsistent laws are problematic, I fully agree. But to conclude that Karen Carr is a baby killer uh, because of inco effectively because of inconsistent laws is ridiculous. To conclude that Karen Carr or that midwives are a danger based on the case in which I represented Karen in Maryland is indefensible. Why? Because in that case, the question wasn't whether. Karen was dangerous or did something wrong. The question was whether she engaged in the practice of medicine. It was largely a dry technical question. The state focused on allegations that what Karen had done was inconsistent with standards of care, even though they were very explicit throughout and recognized that that case was never about whether. Karen's care was good. Everybody agreed that her care was good, that she didn't do anything wrong in that regard. And it was just on that legal question. Micah Salb is an attorney of Lipman, Semsker, and Salb in Bethesda, Maryland. He represented Karen Carr, a Maryland midwife, and the subject of the recent Washington Post article in 2011. <laughs> A little update on one of our past stories before we go. Earlier this year, we stopped by a rally protesting the proposed closure of Burdett Birth Center in Troy, New York. The maternity ward at Samaritan Hospital is the only one in Rensselaer County, meaning its closure could force expectant mothers to travel as far as Albany, Niskayuna, Saratoga Springs, or even Massachusetts to give birth. St. Peter's Health Partners, which owns Samaritan Hospital, had planned to close Burdett by the end of the year. That has now been delayed until at least June, following public outcry in a hearing in September. Earlier this month, St. Peter's held a virtual town hall to take questions on the plan. WAMC's Dave Lucas brings us more. St. Peter's Health Partners president and CEO, Dr. Stephen Hanks, explains Burdett's plight, noting the facility operated at a loss since its inception in 2010, emphasizing that the organization is fully committed to supporting all our patients and colleagues through the closure. We absorbed its losses for the near, ter near term in a hope that we'd be able to turn the finances around. Of course, we never knew what was in our future with the COVID pandemic and the post-pandemic era that has created such difficulty for our not-for-profit health systems really across the country. And in 2020, Burdett Birth Center did formally become part and parcel of Samaritan Hospital. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, then along came COVID and the matters worsened. The factors I mentioned earlier, the nursing shortages, declining births, continue to strain the unit. In the not too distant past, a parent and might have been able to continue to subsidize the losses in the interest of preserving the service. But Samaritan itself and our parents, St. Peter's Health Partners, can no longer absorb mounting maternity service losses of this magnitude, now up to $2.7 million a year. Senior Vice President of Hospital Operations Kim Baker says shuttering Burdett is not a decision St. Peter's wanted to make. We appreciate and experience the special feeling and culture that exists at Burdett Birth Center, especially between the midwives, nurses, patients, and their families. Culture is not a box, 
that we move from Burdett and unpack it at St. Peter's Hospital. Rather, it's a special feeling that we admire and I hope to continue and immerse at St. Peter's Hospital. I want to say again that we will continue to provide 100% of the services to 100% of the patients we're currently serving. The only services impacted by this decision is the site of delivery. So all our patients will continue to receive care without interruption. People watching online were invited to send questions that were addressed by a panel who for the most part offered assurances that most programs, policies, and procedures expectant mothers seek will still be available, including admitting emergency births at Samaritan Hospital. Dr. Katrina Cardos is in charge of Samaritan's ER. All of our physicians are uh, board certified or board eligible residency trained emergency physicians with um, training in how to evaluate, treat, and stabilize patients with um, obstetrical as well as postpartum emergencies. Um, we also have offered, even before we heard of the closure of Burdett, and we'll continue to offer um, refresher courses on neonatal resuscitation. And we um, are also going to be offering um, continued education on uh, OB emergency. Noting that 75% of the women in Rensselaer County who become pregnant already choose delivery outside of that county, Hank says services will be consolidated at St. Peter's. He adds birthing mothers and women having gynecological issues are the highest priority and will get pushed to the front of the line for transportation to the hospital. Hanks Field did a question as to why cutbacks aren't being made at St. Peter's Hospital rather than Samaritan. Because when the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2022, Samaritan broke even on operating income and expenses, while St. Peter's finished $43 million in the red. We made reductions across our system to hit our budget this year. Our fiscal year runs, it's an academic, uh, so it runs from July 1 to June 30th. We had to make an additional $60 million reduction, of which this was just one part for next year. Uh, this, this was not uh, you know, considered for the current fiscal year, but we're on a target to achieve a 3% operating margin by 2025, which we believe is our path to sustainability. Hank says that margin is necessary to maintain investment in technology, facilities, and people in order to sustain care. State Assembly member John McDonald submitted a question that says in part, is this the only public meeting that St. Peter's Health Partners is planning on this potential closure? Our lawyers have told me this does uh, meet the requirements that they've looked at. Uh, in the regulatory language. We are not currently planning any additional uh, forums. Uh, our expectation is we're uh, gonna be moving uh, shortly to submit our closure plan, and then we'll see what uh, the DOH uh, has to uh, uh, ask us in response. The State Department of Health did not immediately reply to a request for comment. A spokesman says the Attorney General has not yet weighed in on the open house. For WAMC News, I'm Dave Lucas. Thanks for listening to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at WAMCpodcast.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at WAMC.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. At night and down the hallway. Sparkle